Welcome to National Parks Traveler, where we explore the national parks and the issues that involve them. This is Kurt Rappencheck, your host at National Parks Traveler. It certainly was a diverse week on the Traveler. We brought you a story about condor recovery efforts at Zion National Park in Utah, looked at the irregular behavior of Steamboat Geyser in Yellowstone National Park in Wyoming, and offered a look at spending time at Stahegan in North Cascades National Park in Washington State. Readers also found stories about camping fees going up at Great Basin National Park in Nevada, construction delays this coming summer on a portion of the carriage roads at Acadia National Park in Maine, and an overview of a winter's visit to Canaveral National Seashore in Florida. There were other stories, of course, and you can find them all at nationalparkstraveler.org. In this week's show, we're talking search and rescue. Each year, there are thousands of search and rescue incidents logged across the national park system. They typically involve missing hikers, visitors who get injured in falls, boating accidents, or climbing accidents. The Intermountain region of the National Park Service, a large swath that runs from northern Montana to the Rio Grande River in Texas, is the largest in the agency and is home to many of the most beautiful and dangerous national parks. Yellowstone has boiling waters and grizzly bears, Grand Canyon has that deep canyon, and Rocky Mountain has alluring and rugged backcountry. To learn more about search and rescue in general, and searches at Rocky Mountain National Park, we've reached out to Kyle Patterson, the park's spokesperson, and Mike Lukens, a climbing ranger who often leads rescue missions in the park. We'll join them in a minute. The North Cascades Institute has a large portfolio. It is an environmental learning center, training center, conference center, and leadership center, all set in the splendor of the North Cascades National Park Complex. Learn more at ncascades.org. We are park stewards to ensure our most wild and historic places remain for generations to come, to safeguard our preferred arena for adventure, reflection, and inspiration. We donate 4% of our proceeds, and that's revenues, not profits, to support America's most wild and historic places. We are Wild Tribute, apparel for the parks. Find out more at wildtribute.com. Acadia National Park is one of the 10 most popular national parks in the United States. It is also one of the smallest and most vulnerable. That's why Friends of Acadia exists. Friends of Acadia is an independent organization of passionate people inspiring those who love this magnificent park to make a real and lasting difference for Acadia. You can make a difference at friendsofacadia.org. The Intermountain region of the National Park Service is the largest in the agency and is home to many of the most beautiful and the most dangerous national parks. Yellowstone has boiling waters and grizzly bears, Grand Canyon has that deep canyon, and Rocky Mountain has a luring and rugged backcountry. Back in 2017, the Intermountain region logged 1,155 search and rescue incidents. Grand Canyon led the tally in the region with 290 incidents that year, while Rocky Mountain was second with 165. The majority of those Rocky Mountain incidents, 55 of the 165, involved visitors between the age of 20 and 29. Five of the SARS resulted in fatalities. Rocky Mountain can be an unforgiven park for those ill-prepared to head into the backcountry, especially those who go alone. To learn more about search and rescue in general, and searches at Rocky Mountain National Park specifically, we've reached out to Kyle Patterson, the park spokesperson, and Mike Lukens, a climbing ranger at Rocky Mountain. Welcome to The Traveler. Hey, how's it going? Hi, Kurt. Nice to talk to you. Hi, Kyle. Thanks for joining me. Right off the bat, let's just talk about SARS in general, search and rescues. How prepared are parks to deal with them? I mean, I, I guess you guys do constant training to make sure that you're, you're ready, your teams are ready to go out there no matter what the condition, no matter what time of day. Sure. So park service, you know, across park service or search and rescue programs, different parks have larger programs based on their, their rescue load. So, you know, I can speak to Rockies specifically. We generally hire seasonal staff that are dedicated to search and rescue in the mountains um, in the summer 
And then we train specifically through technical rope rescue to patient care, to littered wheel evacs, uh, and continually host trainings throughout the year. So as you know, the winter progresses, we are now focused on winter rescue. So avalanche rescue and evac of patients from the winter environment. So we'll host our trainings every two weeks at a minimum where park staff and outside entities and partners come to train with us to make sure that we're prepared for whatever we might see. And, and throughout the year, um, throughout the seasons, you run into a bunch of different SARS. It's really hard to say this is the, the biggest type of search and rescue mission we go on, or, or, or is it possible to define it that way? For us, you know, historically, our, our busy season is May till usually the end of September, and with the heavy period being after the July 4th weekend through the end of August. So somewhere around 80% of our search and rescue incidents that happen in that time period. And so summertime environment, although working in the mountains, we still deal with snow, sleet, hail, extreme weather, and changing conditions. So really it may be summer, but on long speak, it's it's winter time sometimes in August. So we still have to be prepared both mentally and physically and with the, the appropriate equipment to deal with those rescues. Um, but like I said, most of our visitation and most of our incidents occur during the summer. Yeah. Is there a typical search and rescue mission, typical injury? Sure. I'd say 90% of our rescue incidents occur from hikers on trail who either somehow had some sort of injury to their knee or their ankle, and they're usually within just a couple miles of the trailhead. And so that involves usually a wheeled litter or maybe a horse evac, and they wrap up in maybe five to eight hours. A short day. <laughs> Well, depending. And sometimes they run through the night, yeah. Rocky Mountain certainly isn't the biggest park in the Intermountain region. It might be small compared to, say, uh, Yellowstone or the Grand Canyon in terms of acreage. And yet there's a lot of search and rescues at Rocky Mountain. Any any idea why is that? You know, the park is obviously very well loved and visited. We have a large metropolitan population with Denver and the Front Range communities. Um, with fairly easy access to get into, you know, the mountains and in the backcountry. And I would say because of our visitation and the terrain that we have in the park, um, those two factors have led to the number of SAR incidents that we have. I've been covering national parks closely for 15 years now and have been enjoying them all my life. And one phrase that comes up time after time with a, a search and rescue that I've never really heard a, a, a good definition of it, and hopefully you can enlighten me and our listeners, but a hasty search. What is a hasty search? Sure. So the way a hasty search works is we'll get a call for a missing individual, either someone, a family member or a friend that was either hiking with that person or they were supposed to contact and check back in with. So the call us, let us know there's an individual that's overdue in the park. And we'll conduct what we call a hasty search where we get the most information we can at the time from the reporting party. And we send out a small group of rangers to go out and search the most highly probable areas that this person would be. Um, and that's just our initial search phase. It's like day one. Once we get the call, it's our immediate response. And then as time rolls on, say we don't find that person initially, then we start to grow into this larger search planning process where we we do more of a systematic breakdown, do some probabilities, use computer programs to calculate highest uh, probable areas to search for someone. I think that's one aspect of, of search and rescue that the general public really isn't that familiar with. I mean, it, it really is a technical approach that you guys use to try and find somebody. Sure. Yeah. And all this has been learned over time, you know, over the last 50, 60, 70 years of people being involved in search and rescue. We look at lost person behavior, so trying to get the most information about the person. And then there's textbooks on lost person behavior that you can go through and, and it'll give you kind of cues and ideas of, of how you might go about searching for this person and maybe what tendencies they would have. Say so maybe they're looking for high points or, or things like that. Uh, and then a lot of investigations going into figuring out the person where they were in their life, what's going on with them, those types of things to better direct our search efforts. And then, like I said, we do use computer programs and things to run statistics to help better focus our search patterns. And what type of statistics go into that? So a lot of it is um, based on area and then 
um, how well you can cover an area, if that makes sense. So you send a search party into a defined search area and we'll have blocks or grids and they'll go in, they'll search an area and um, you know, they say, yeah, I'm this percentage likelihood that we covered everything and this person could or could not be in there. And you take that information from each area, each search team, you compute or put it into a computer program and then run through again, and then it'll come out with areas that need more searching uh, and help to exclude other areas that maybe we feel pretty comfortable about. Are you able to put in information about the individual you're looking for in terms of their age and physical behavior and whether it's a male or a female? You know, that information hasn't gone into the computer programming, but that information is in those textbooks, like I said, lost person behavior that will help influence decisions also. So it's not just relying only on computers. That's just one part of the search planning. It's kind of this holistic approach of taking that information we're getting out of the computer program, taking on the ground intel from, and then just historic knowledge of where people have gotten lost in certain areas in the past, and then using that all to formulate a search plan. Now, as you said, a lot of your um, search and rescue comes down to, to day hikers who might have twisted an ankle or, or tweaked their knees or whatnot. And then you've got, for lack of a better description, the more newsworthy uh, search and rescues where um, an individual goes missing, whether it's up the, the Long Peak area or uh, Long's Peak area or Wild Basin or whatnot. Can you kind of define that search individual who, who gets lost in those extreme backcountry areas? So, yeah, you, like I said, 90% of our rescues are those people that are staying on standard trails, right? They either tripped on a tree root, something like that. They've had a medical emergency. Our, our visitors are generally going more off trail. They're into mountaineering. They may be into trail running or climbing. Uh, it's a different demographic for sure than our average visitor. It's, it's generally males in their 20s to 30s. And then on the opposite end, we get males in their 50s and 60s. It's kind of like these two subgroups of people that we find are attracted to places like Long's Peak and to off-trail travel. Uh, with a smaller subsect of females being in there, but I'd say it's it's definitely a dominated by men. And of course, seeking adventure or, or those types of mindsets, probably a little bit more risk tolerant. I, I, I'm surprised by your mention of men 50 to 60 being in that category. A, any idea why? I mean, fortunately, I'm past that age group, so. <laughs> All I could do is guess, right? Because um, I think probably former mountaineers or climbers or adventurous people that were in their 20s and 30s and 40s and maybe in their 50s and 60s have decided to give it a shot again. Or people had never taken part in that activity and decided this is their last hurrah and that they should do it. I really can't say, to be honest. I just, we see those trends. A larger group of men that are younger, but then again, there's a noticeable number that are in those age groups of 50 to 60. Yeah, yeah. Is there a particular area of Rocky Mountain National Park that seems to attract more of these search and rescue incidents? Uh, so in terms of sheer numbers, it's, you know, it's the standard trails in the park. In terms of more complex incidents, it would be mountainous terrain. Long's Peak probably being one of the highest areas in terms of complexity for us. So Mount Meeker and Long's are right next to each other. And then the Glacier Gorge area. Uh, and that's probably about as remote as you can get in the park, at least on the east side. And then also some of the most serious terrain you can get into. Yeah, exactly. Um, serious terrain. I mean, you guys have had some pretty big um, search and rescue missions in, in recent years. And um, it's hard to find somebody. That, that, that's basically what it comes down to. Yeah, it's especially if you're wearing neutral colors. And from a helicopter, which we search with, you know, it's like I could be standing on the ground active and alive trying to wave in a helicopter with a bright yellow jacket with an orange flare like stripe on the hood which is supposed to be highly visible and they still can't see me. I can talk to them on their, on the a radio. So in order to find someone that's either been severely injured or no longer alive in terrain can be really difficult. And we have so much of that terrain and it's also very hazardous for our rescuers that sometimes we have to rely on helicopters or aviation. And the probability of spotting someone from there is pretty low. And so yeah. that's how these things drag on for weeks or months. Um, you know, it's like trying to cover every inch of terrain, but you can still miss someone, especially in, in steep terrain. Now, I'm sure it's hard to um, describe a typical search and rescue in some of that terrain, but um, 
How big are your teams at, at Rocky Mountain in terms of personnel? And, and do you always put all of them in or it depends on the incident, how many you call out? Sure. So we, we have many people that are involved in search and rescue in the park. And I, I think Rocky's unique in the fact that we have, you know, park service employees from every division, people that work in maintenance and facilities that work in the entrance gates that work in interpretation or work in administration that come out to our SAR trainings and take part in search and rescue incidents. So we generally have somewhere around 100 to 120 people on our call out list that we can use, uh, especially in the summer. But then as different types of rescues come about, we have smaller teams with different skill sets that they train for. So let's say something like a technical rescue on the diamond on Long's Peak, we probably have 10 to 12 people that I would feel comfortable sending into that training. And then in terms of scrambling and mountain terrain with out the need for ropes, then we have a larger group of 30 to 35. And throughout the year, you're, you're training in different situations? We are. So, you know, as during the winter, we're going to train more so specifically to snow and avalanche terrain and snow anchors and things like that. Although it's still, we use technical rope rescue skills in the winter, but it with a different twist, I would say. Uh, and then we do have more general kind of just SAR trainings that occur throughout the summer and winter. And I guess these uh, individuals have to be pretty physically uh, fit to tackle some of these incidents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, anyone that takes part in search and rescue has to be, you know, for one, they have to want to be outside. And two, it is a very physical activity. Not only are you walking long distances over steep terrain, you're also carrying heavy equipment. Because not only are you carrying your gear that you have to be prepared for for the day or up to 24 hours, then you have to carry group gear and rescue equipment on top of that. Wow. Do you put them through tests? I know a friend of mine uh, worked for the Forest Service, and he was a firefighter. And, and each each season to get his red card, I guess, he had to put a pack on his back, a 40-pound pack or so, and, and cover so much distance and so much amount of time. That, you know, that's the question within the Park Service Search and Rescue community is there are guidelines that have been written that haven't been put in, put in place where at some point they're going to make search and rescue technicians take part in a physical and a pack test. At this point, that's not necessary. A lot of it's vetting from internally, if that makes sense. So just making sure that one, that people have the interest and two, that they have the skill sets and the, and the physical fitness in order to accomplish the job. What particular skill sets are you searching for? So one, someone that wants to be outside and can take care of themselves in all, all weather and environment. And then two, people that are easy to get along with and team players. And then someone that has a, a passion to continue to learn and to take a leadership role at some point. We're talking today with Mike Lukens, a climbing ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park, and Kyle Patterson, a spokesperson for the park, about search and rescue in Rocky Mountain National Park. We're going to take a short break, and we'll be right back. Listener and reader support make National Parks Traveler possible every day of the year. If you enjoy the Traveler's content, please consider a donation via nationalparkstraveler.org. Western National Parks Association is a nonprofit education partner of the National Park Service. WNPA supports parks across the West, developing products, services, and programs that enhance the visitor experience, understanding, and appreciation of national parks. Learn more at WNPA.org. The Grand Teton National Park Foundation is a private, nonprofit organization that supports projects that protect and enhance Grand Teton National Park's cultural, historic, and natural resources. By funding initiatives that go beyond what the National Park Service could accomplish on its own, Foundation donors improve the visitor experience and provide benefits to the National Park System for decades to come. See their successes at gtnpf.org. Washington State is graced with three spectacular national parks, each different and special in their own unique ways. As the official nonprofit partner and the only philanthropic organization dedicated exclusively to supporting these parks through charitable contributions, Washington's National Park Fund has a mission to deepen the public's love for, understanding of, and experiences in Mount Rainier, North Cascades, and Olympic National Parks. Share your passion for these parks at WNPF.org. 
The Blue Ridge Parkway Foundation is the primary nonprofit fundraising partner for the Blue Ridge Parkway. It is made up of people who have a deep love for this majestic road and want to ensure that its natural beauty and the experiences it offers endure for generations to come. Show your appreciation at brpfoundation.org. We're back today with Mike Lukens, a climbing ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park, and Kyle Patterson, the park's spokesperson, talking about search and rescue incidents in Rocky Mountain National Park. Mike, Kyle, I guess there have been some SARS, I know across the park system, and I'm guessing some in Rocky Mountain, that have gone unresolved, that you, you didn't find the, the individual. Yeah, I mean, we, we still have a search that's ongoing for uh, a visitor who went missing uh, several winters ago at this point. You know, we spent a significant amount of time and hours searching for this individual and, you know, it's still on our minds and it's still an active search. So, yeah, it may be years before we find evidence or clues. I'm, I'm unsure at this point. Now, now, when you define it as an active search, uh, I mean, you're not still going out into the field every day to search for somebody. No, what I mean is the case isn't closed, right? It's it's still, we still plan for searching, uh, you know, as clues come up and things like that will ramp up and expand. But yeah, what we're, we're in what we're, the Park Service loves to call limited continuous mode, where we're going to continue to plan for and take, seek information from the public. And if we're out and about and we see something, or maybe we'll have a targeted day here or there for searching certain areas. Uh, but we're not actively planning every day to send people on the field. Yeah. Now in, in Rocky Mountain, um, as you said, it's an extreme landscape. Depending on the time of year, you can have extreme weather conditions. And, you know, depending on where you are in the park, you can have extreme weather conditions every every month of the year. And so you can't always conduct searches indefinitely, active searches, putting putting people out into the field day after day, week after week. There's got to be some pressure coming from from families to ask that you keep searching no matter how bleak things look. How, how do you deal with that, Kyle? You know, Kurt, it's always a really, really, as you can imagine, difficult, heart-wrenching conversation to have with families. We've been very fortunate here, as Mike was mentioning, you know, a lot of our search and rescues that happen here are not um, long extended searches that go weeks or months, but we have had a few and we've had some within the last couple of years. And You know, fortunately, most of those now have been resolved, but it is a very difficult conversation to have with families. And, um, you know, it depends on the all of the things that Mike uh, mentioned previously as to the location, the conditions, you know, the areas that we have searched and our confidence that the areas we have searched, we would have found uh, someone And then just, again, because of the extreme nature of the weather, we also have to start considering survivability, which is also a very, very difficult conversation, as you can imagine, Mm -hmm. to have with the loved ones of the person that's missing. And in terms of, uh, you know, some of these individuals, I mean, I I know I went through a phase in my life where uh, I was immortal and I could go anywhere I wanted to go and, and survive and whatnot different type of makeup of of people who get lost. I mean, you probably have some of those individuals who do it. Um, I guess suicidal tendencies also come up in some of these cases, no? Well, as Mike mentioned, when um, we're doing on-the-ground investigation, too, that's certainly something I think, you know, Mike mentioned really looking at at the mindset as much as we can and the well-being of the individual that's missing. And so as we're conducting a search for an individual, we also have members of our staff that are conducting a simultaneous investigation and, you know, really trying to inquire about some of the really important things tied to the search. As Mike mentioned, you know, what, what's their preparedness? What clothing would they be wearing? Is this an area they've ever explored before? Have they done anything in, in a, a similar terrain if it's not at Rocky somewhere else? So it gives the searchers, uh, you know, more information as to all of the things that Mike mentioned um, to try to really think through their mindset. And then we're also inquiring about the person's, you know, um, mental health as well, 
and whether there was anything going on in their lives that we need to know that aspect too. So oftentimes that investigation is happening. uh, It's always happening simultaneous uh, to our search efforts. Mm -hmm. You know, and I I guess it has to be mentally wearing on the searchers as well. I mean, it's a job, but at the same time, you've got some emotional investment, I would think, in trying to find that individual who's missing. Yeah, I mean, my my goal is always to go out in the field and along with all the rest of our searchers and find that person, whether they're alive or not, and to bring some closure to their family. So, you know, to stop searching for someone or to scale back due to weather and conditions and whatnot, while I realize it's important for my well-being and my health and for my coworkers, it's it's hard on us, to be honest. At the end of the day, we just want to bring those people home. Yeah. Yeah. Now, you were mentioned earlier about uh, some of the more typical search and rescues, uh, the hikers where you might have to uh, you know, get a wheeled cart to take them out or, or on horseback maybe. And then you have uh, your short haul incidents. Um, explain short haul to the listeners. <laughs> so ironically, Rocky doesn't have a helicopter with a short haul program. So what we usually utilize is the National Guard and we'll do a hoist. So a short haul, if you can imagine, is a helicopter with a rope attached to the belly of the helicopter with a rescuer on the end of that rope. And so they can fly into terrain unattached from the rope, do whatever they need to do for patient care, package that person so that they can fly. The helicopter comes back around with the rope, attaches to both the rescuer and the patient, and they fly off on the end of the line. Uh, Hoist is a bit different. There's a cable that comes down out of the aircraft with the attendant or the rescuer on it. They get lowered down as the helicopter stationary, disconnect, package the patient, helicopter comes back around, they'll hook in with the hoist and then hoist them back up into the aircraft physically. So uh, two different methods. The aircraft we have available in the state currently only have hoist. Uh, On occasion, we'll have the Grand Tetons or the Grand Canyon come if they're around or they'll come down if we know we have a a larger or longer rescue going on to help us out. Okay. Okay. So you don't do short hauls there? It's just hoist? We do not. It's just hoist at this point. Yeah. Okay. And that's just because of the equipment you have available? Yeah. Yes. Uh, You know, certain places like the Grand Tetons have a helicopter in park that's on under contract. uh, And we do not currently have something like that. So we have to use cooperators. Gotcha. Gotcha. This past year um, with COVID, uh, it was kind of interesting that it it brought a lot of people out to the national park system. Um, A lot of those people who may not have been experienced with national parks um, came out to national parks. And I know there at Rocky, you guys kind of had a um, a reservation system, if I could call it that, to kind of manage the the crowds that you had in the park. Notwithstanding that, did you notice a different type of visitor um, this past year? Uh, Kyle could probably answer this just as well as I can. I'd say people are probably a little bit better prepared, at least in understanding most that they had to have a permit to get into the park. So they did a little bit more prep work, but on the trails and whatnot, to me, I didn't distinguish much difference, to be honest. I would concur with that. You know, because of our time entry permit reservation system, we had about a decrease, Kurt, of a 30% in our overall visitation. Yeah. Yeah. In, in May through October, or through mid-October. So since Rocky is, you know, the third most visited national park, certainly that, you know, impacted our overall visitation and the number of search and rescue incidents we had. And also, as Mike mentioned, because people had to have reservations from that 6 a.m. to 5 p.m., period, you have to plan ahead more. And so oftentimes if people are planning ahead, then preparedness may be part of that, but I think it's too, it's um, too soon to know that for sure. And we really don't have, you know, that would be mainly anecdotal. We certainly, you know, still had incidents. We still certainly, um, our search and rescue teams, you know, stayed busy as they always do. So you didn't see a a noticeable increase or decrease? No. No, And so it's hard. Yeah. It's hard to tie that, whether that was tied to overall visitation or the types of visitors that were coming in. And Mike, I think you were trying to say something too there. Yeah, and so, you know, so the park was shut down at some point to all visitation in the spring. And then of course, with fire impacts in the fall, we had some closures and some other, you know, visitation decreases. You know, our total numbers of SARS were down this year. I think we had around 112 to 115 versus, you know, we hover around 150 to 160. But if we were to look at the number of days that the park were open, 
to the number of incidents we had. I mean, to me, it felt like we were as busy, if not busier than ever. So that's just anecdotal once again, but I mean, the average job to be about a star every day or so. Wow. During those summer periods. So I, I don't know if the visitation actually decreased our SAR load, to be honest. It just, we didn't, weren't working in May, right? Because the park was shut down. And then, you know, as the fire season came about in, in the fall, then we weren't, you know, we didn't have visitors in the park per se. Yeah. So, yeah. I don't know if we did, you know, per capita numbers of SARS to people that came to the park, we might actually be higher than we were in years past. I, I really don't know. We'd have to analyze that data. Yeah, it'd be interesting to to crunch it out. Of course, uh, the the twenty twenty one peak season is, is months away. Um, <laughs> you're laughing. I'm am I? <laughs> I'm right, right? <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. I mean, we're in winter for us. It's not the peak, but it's definitely become busier. So this winter thus far has been busier than I've ever seen in the winter. No kidding. D- does that translate into to more search and rescue missions or? You know, thus far it has not. It's been quiet, knock on wood. Um, but I anticipate more people getting into the backcountry and skiing this winter than we've ever seen. As long as that snow comes through. As long as we get snow. Yeah, you're correct. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, did, did I miss anything in, in talking about uh, your search and rescue program there at Rocky? No, you know, I just really want to highlight that, you know, it takes everyone to be successful here. And not only park employees, but our cooperators like Rocky Mountain Rescue Group out of Boulder County and Larimer County Search and Rescue, and then the National Guard and all these other entities that make our SAR program uh, actually work. And like I said, without other park employees in these groups, it would be impossible to keep up with the workload that we have. I bet. And, and Kyle, I guess messaging is um, something you do every day to, to keep visitors aware of their surroundings. I know it was once described to me that um, a lot of SAR victims go on vacation to a national park and they leave their brain on vacation. Um, so it must require a lot of messaging to make sure they're, they're appreciative of their surroundings. No, it, it, the communication really is a big part of it and just the planning ahead and the preparedness. And, and so our, we call, we call it Kurt preventative search and rescue. So if we can connect with our park visitors before they come, because if they're waiting until they get here, to, to plan ahead, it's, it's too late. And so I think it goes back to many of the things that, that uh, Mike was mentioning, you know, particularly during the winter time or our, um, you know, our seasons, transitionary seasons like spring and fall that can become winter within an hour, depending on where you are, elevation, rugged terrain in the park. So really planning ahead and, and um, with really just oftentimes basic things that, people maybe take for granted or they just minimize to some point because they don't necessarily understand what it's like to get hypothermia. Or if you don't have the proper gear or equipment and you get caught in some kind of squall or storm, how it can become life-threatening, you know, really, really quickly. We've all probably been in those situations where we think, whew, that could have come out a lot worse if I wouldn't have had the proper preparedness and gear and ready for something like this. And, and the mountains present those kind of challenges, you know, every day. You know, you mentioned hypothermia, and indeed that is a um, horrible condition to be in. And, I, and I'm curious, Mike, if you can tell, you know, in some of those backcountry search and rescues, um, was it hypothermia that, that uh, killed a person or, or was it a, a misstep in a fall or uh, possibly a combination of both of those, I guess? Yeah, you know, it's it's hard to tell. Obviously, if someone's deceased in the field, what they died from, we leave that to the coroner. But I would say that we've definitely had visitors have succumbed to the elements. So hypothermia, cold, and then it could be potentially that people, you know, as you become more hypothermic, your body temperature drops, your decision making becomes worse, right? And so right. there's potential that people, as they become colder, start making poor decisions unknowingly. And that could also then tie into you know, their untimely death. Uh, but yeah, it's really hard to know for sure. I can tell you that we have lots of visitors or not lots, but many visitors I've responded to over the years that become hypothermic, right? Because they get lost or whatnot. We find them, but then we have to treat them. Uh, right. And most likely without being found, they, you know, the outcome would have been much different. I think the other thing too, you know, oftentimes, Kurt, we get asked, should people recreate by themselves? And 
oftentimes uh, when we've had some of these major searches, the people have been solo. So I think the big thing that we really try to share with visitors is if you are planning on recreating by yourselves, which a lot of people, that's how they experience the wilderness or um, that's the way they want to recreate is to have that solace. It becomes even more critical that if you are recreating by yourself in a place like Rocky, that you have to be, you know, uber prepared and, and plan ahead. And, you know, I think that that continues to be a lesson learned in searches, not only in Rocky Mountain National Park, but searches in, in any location is letting people know where you're going and when you plan to return and then sticking with that, sticking with that route, because that is a, is a huge um, plus for our search and rescue teams if we have some of that information. And oftentimes, Kurt, we, we don't have that information. So when our search and rescue teams are trying to find that search location that Mike was mentioning and really trying to use all of this information and, and uh, experience that they have, it's really, really beneficial if somebody has given somebody kind of a flight path of, of where they're going. So I don't know if Mike wants to elaborate any on that, but that would be another great thing we'd like to get across as well. Um, because I think we're seeing more and more people that are choosing to recreate by themselves. And so I think that would be something we'd really like to try to convey. Sure. Yeah. And we're not, we're not condoning or telling people one way or the other travel alone or not. I understand the benefits of traveling in wilderness and that, you know, opportunity for solitude. I, I think numbers and with, you know, numbers of people, you're going to be safer, to be honest. Like it's very rare we respond to an incident where multiple people have perished, if that makes sense. Right. So I'm less worried about a party of two or three than I am of an overdue for one person. Um, because, you know, generally we'll hear something from one of those party members at some point. But yeah, if you're traveling alone, have a plan. Make sure people know where you're going and when you're supposed to come back and know who to contact if you don't meet those uh, you know, check-in points. Uh, and that will go a long ways for just informing where we're going to go. And it's been you know, the difference between a, a positive and a negative outcome in some of our incidents. When we knew where someone was or where they potentially were going, we could focus all our efforts on that area. And they were only overdue by a couple of hours versus you know, a week or two. Um, by that time period, it's really hard. Yeah, yeah. I'm curious, you know, everybody who goes into a national park usually gets handed the, the park newspaper at the entrance station. Is there a form in the park newspaper that if somebody's going on a hike, they can you know, tear it out and write where they're going when they expect to be back and leave it on the dashboard of their car? We do not have a form like that um, because we also don't want people to think that we are uh, – we are tracking people and or responsible for, for folks. So, you know, we, we don't often regularly check cars at trailheads and things like that. So it really comes down to that personal responsibility of our visitors. They really need to be telling someone that's not with them necessarily. If they do, as Mike said, you know, make that choice to recreate by themselves. And we do encourage, you know, people to write a piece of paper on their, um, you know, put it in their dashboard or in the seat of their car, explaining where they are. But better yet, you know, tell somebody where you're going. And if they don't hear from you by a certain time, then have them, you know, call us versus just kind of put something at the trailhead, expecting us to kind of be monitoring. Yeah. Okay. We've been talking today with Mike Lukens, a climbing ranger at Rocky Mountain National Park, and Kyle Patterson, the park spokesperson about search and rescue in general and search and rescue in Rocky Mountain National Park. Kyle, Mike, thanks so much for joining me, and uh, best of luck that the coming year um, is less eventful. All right, well, thanks for having us. Thanks so much, Kurt. That's our show for this week. We hope you enjoyed it. Thanks to all who donated to The Traveler during our year-end campaign that ran in November and December. I'm happy to say that we reached our $35,000 goal, and it's being put to work assigning stories to freelancers, including some in Canada. In the weeks ahead, we'll be reporting on how COVID impacted the recreational vehicle industry. Spoiler alert, 
It drove quite a lot of business to those manufacturers and the issue of Confederate monuments in the park system. We'll also take a trip to a remote island off the coast of Nova Scotia that is part of the Canadian park system. For The Traveler, this is Kurt Repencheck. The composers and musicians at Orange Tree Productions have created a unique collection known as the National Park Series that has grown to include more than 30 CD titles. Composed against the backdrop of a park's sounds of nature, these musical scores will connect you with these beautiful places and take you there, at least in your mind. This collection is the number one selling National Park audio series in the world and provides the background music for National Park's Travelers podcasts. Visit them at orangetreeproductions.com. Editing and production work for the National Parks Traveler podcast series is done by Splitbeard Productions. You can learn more about us at splitbeardproductions.com. National Parks Traveler is a 501c3 nonprofit media organization that provides daily editorial coverage of national parks and protected areas. Traveler's coverage is made possible by reader and listener donations. Visit us at nationalparkstraveler.org.